All right, so I we're waiting for many more, but I think we'll start, and then if people trickle in, great, and if not, we can get cozier, and then we'll just, we'll see how that goes. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm Alyssa Marlow, and I teach in the health studies department. Um, and I actually taught a very similar session to this at the Anne Farron Conference in January with my very dear friend and now former colleague, Tom Nessie, who has moved on to join the army, just sent me some photos of his training, which looked quite intense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this is sort of an adaptation of that presentation that we did together in January. Um, and I don't know if anybody was here then, um, but I hope you enjoy. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and how it is that I have ended up here and teaching this in this particular moment. Um, this is a picture of me on my honeymoon. Mm -hmm. You can see the shadow of my husband, but I cut him out of the picture. <laughs> 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 He's also standing upside down. And this is me and my son. Um, who he's been teaching yoga with me since he was five weeks old. Um, so I joined AU in, a year ago, again, in the Department of Health Studies, teaching public health, health promotion, stress management, um, the range of those classes. <laughs> 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 uh, my colleague Ethan is teaching that this semester, if you're interested. <laughs> um, so I just started a year ago. It's been fabulous. Before that, I spent most of my professional life working overseas in global health, primarily in HIV prevention, some in maternal and child health, which is actually a new class I'm teaching this semester, which I'm excited about. Um, so works all over the world, um, in Haiti and the Congo and Kenya, and most recently in Vietnam. Um, and in Vietnam, after about 20 years of practicing yoga, sort of for myself, my colleagues started um, cajoling me and then putting more and more pressure on me to start teaching some yoga classes for them. And these were my Vietnamese colleagues, and I sort of thought, I don't teach, I just practice. And then that, eventually, they convinced me that you could try. And I started teaching classes that got bigger and bigger, and. Um, it sort of transformed my whole experience of where I was working for the U.S. government, for USAID at that point, and it sort of transformed my whole experience of work with them. It transformed our relationships, um, and it was really wonderful. Actually, just was in South Africa at the International AIDS Conference a couple of this summer. We ran into some colleagues, and they said, guess what? We're still doing yoga classes. We hired someone to come in, and they come twice a week, and..." We still talk about when we did the classes in the little weird area in the office. And anyway, I was that sort of made my whole conference. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, um, so I moved to DC, followed the shadow of husband <laughs> um, to DC. <laughs> and he, um, I mean, because he also works in HIV, and his work brought him here. And at that point, my teaching yoga sort of took on a life of its own, and I started teaching yoga full-time and left my public health work for a little while, for a few years. Um, and it was great. I became a yoga therapist and worked privately with clients and work with studio classes. And, um, it was wonderful. At the same time, I started missing working at the population level and thinking about the big picture. And so here I am, <laughs> doing all of that teaching, which I love, thinking about the big picture. Um, and incorporating a lot of what I do in the yoga setting into my academic classes. I'm not teaching yoga here, I'm teaching public health classes. Um, but I thought that the experience I had in Vietnam with my colleagues and what that did for our office was really powerful. And, um, and the way that I start a yoga class, um, I, it's a class about relaxing, learning how to breathe and to connect with your body, but I start all those classes with the assumption that we've all come into that yoga setting with our heads swirling and thinking about a thousand things and probably stressed out, and so we breathe, and we do a little meditation, 
and take a moment just to be quiet. <laughs> um, and it occurred to me pretty quickly into my time here, like two weeks in, why don't I do that in my classrooms? <laughs> because all my students are absolutely coming in with at least as much going on in their heads. My boyfriend just broke up with me. I failed this exam. My roommate's having a fight with me. Whatever. And why would I possibly expect those students to be better able to dive into the content I was going to teach them than I would think my other students were? So I started teaching a little bit of mindfulness, like two to five minutes at the start of every class. And it's been really great. So I want to sort of tell you about that journey. I want to tell you about why I think it's particularly important on our campus. Some of you have probably heard Santa Oz's wonderful sessions about our campus, our student body. I'll share some of that data with you. I'll tell you, I'll give you some tools and show you some ways that I introduce mindfulness in the classroom. I'll tell you why the science tells us this works. And then I want to talk about how that might work for you and how you might sort of adapt some of this in your own house. So before we do any of that, I want you just to take out a piece of paper and write on that piece of paper on a scale of 1 to 10 what your stress level is right at this very moment, right now. One being you're practically on a tropical island <laughs> sipping a wonderful beverage brief one. Ten, you're basically incapacitated by your level of stress. <laughs> and so write down that number, and then maybe just a sentence or two, a couple words about that. Why? What's going on? Why are you feeling like that? You don't have to share. This is just for you. I want to start with an exercise. Um, and I'll sort of pepper some exercises throughout what we're doing. The mindfulness exercises that I use in the classroom, I hope that you'll enjoy them just for yourself and for your own level of stress. And maybe one or two of them will resonate for you in the classroom. Um, so we're going to start with a breath exercise. And I think this is one of the nice ways to start. It's really accessible. We all do it. Um, we do it without thinking about it. It's a nice way to build trust before you get into anything a little bit more esoteric, a little bit more out there. This is something really tangible that we can all kind of, we can wrap our heads around, our students can wrap our heads around. So I like to start with this one. So in my classes, I invite my students to get comfortable before we do this. So I'm going to invite you to do the same thing. I often like to take off my shoes. You're welcome to do that. This is easier in the summer than the winter when there's less boots and untying and laces and whatnot. Um, you are welcome in this and all the rest of the exercises we're going to do to sit or stand or sit on the floor. Sometimes my students lay on the floor for some of the longer <laughs> ones. <laughs> That's fine, and just to wear it, whatever makes you feel comfortable is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, stress management actually was the only, the only class where they really took me up on laying on the floor. <laughs> but I give it as an option. <laughs> um, okay, so if everybody's sitting, then let's um, model for you sitting. So I want us to sit mindfully. So I'm going to take my shoes off. So 
sit kind of near the edge of your seat. So your sit bones are kind of perched on the edge. Structurally, what that does is tip your pelvis forward. When your pelvis tips forward, it helps your spine to length. And as your spine is lengthening, I've probably just gotten totally out of the camera. Okay, we're good. Okay. Um, as your spine is lengthening, you're giving, you're creating some more space for your breath. So sit perched there. Have both of your feet on the floor. Whether or not you have shoes on doesn't matter. Feet firmly on the floor. You're not crossing your legs. Just sitting there. Okay. Your hands can be somewhat comfortable. So I tell my students, energetically, if you're feeling a little hectic or stressed out, having palms down is a nice way of reinforcing being grounded. Okay. If you're feeling a little bit sleepy, a bit worn out, palms up is a nice way to re-energize. <coughs> Just having the palms nestled together. Also, I think this is a nidra, cosmic nidra, sort of a universal connection. Simple. So any of those is fine. So if you're comfortable for this and the other exercises we'll do, I'll invite you to close your eyes. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to do that. That's okay. Mm -hmm. With your eyes closed, just begin to feel your feet on the floor. If you have your shoes off, you can actually feel what the ground feels like under you. If you have your shoes on, just be aware of the sensation of your feet landing on the earth. of your feet. You start to feel your tailbone. Let your tailbone get a little heavy. As if you can send a tap root from your tailbone right to the center of the earth. And as it sinks down, it steadies it. And you grow a little bit more stable, grounded, connected. And then you might notice a little adjustment in your pelvis to get a little bit taller. We often tend to either arch our back or tuck the tailbone inside the place that's relatively neutral there. And as the tailbone and the sit bones and the sacrum settle, feel the whole rest of your spine from the bottom to the top growing a little more buoyant. Getting a little taller. When your neck decompresses, the crown of your head starts to float a little bit. And then all the weight burdens you have right now, any weights that you're carrying around with you, imagine that you could pour that weight into two spinning bags and plop them on either shoulder. And your shoulders get a little heavier. And then get rid of the same bags, but let the shoulders stay heavy away from your hips. And then just for a moment, pay attention to your breath without doing anything about it. Just start to be aware. We're going to play with the breath a little bit. What I'm going to teach you is ultimately a Durga breath in Sanskrit. Durga means a three-part breath. So for the first few moments, I want you to just focus all of your breath into your low belly. And try not to breathe anywhere else except the lowest part of your lungs. So you'll fill up the low belly. And when I say low belly, I don't just mean right right under your navel. And for this part, you might have your hand or both one or both hands on your belly. That might help to feel. You don't have to, but that helps you sort of have that sensation. You're feeling your belly, but also you're feeling the space underneath your kidneys. So breathe into your back. There's the ones that are too. They go all the way around the body. Breathe into the low waist. So as if you have an inner tube in the lowest part of your torso, you're filling up the whole circumference of that in the of your breath. And then let's just take one full breath in together. And then exhale it out. And this time I want you to fill the lowest in the two and then pause. And just float at the top of that breath for a moment. And then exhale it out. This is just getting used to that pause, that hold. And then Inhale and fill to that lowest energy, pause, and then exhale and pause. Okay, so this one we're going to add a step. 
So inhale to that lowest inner tube, but not all your breath, just part of your breath and pause. And then inhale from the navel to the sternum, the middle bands. And then use that to fill the rest of the way from you. So you're filling navel to sternum all the way around the circumference of your body. So you feel the lower parts of your ribs flaring out. You'll feel the very bottom tips of your shoulder blades flaring out. Do a couple of those at your own pace. Filling to the navel, pausing. And then filling to the sternum and pausing. And then once you're to the sternum and you pause, just exhale completely, easily, full. One more like that. And then the last part of this breath will be three parts. So we'll fill this lower inner tube to the navel pause, then this middle inner tube to the sternum pause, and then let the breath rise all the way up to tickle the underneath of your collarbones, to fill underneath the tops of your shoulder blades. Pause when you're completely full, hold the breath for a moment, and then exhale in the breath. Take a few like that, those three part breaths. Take as much care and time in your as you're taking in your inhales. Really release all of the air completely so that when you fill back up with your inhale, it's fresh and clean. Shoulders so heavy. Let your face be relaxed. Very relaxed. Your, your stress level. What's going on for you? What can you have? Okay. You've just missed the first exercise. There's more to come. <laughs> so I wanted to just note, by the way, that the breath exercise we just did is one of about a zillion breath exercises you could possibly do. There is a whole, so yoga, by the way, is made up of eight limbs. I think I maybe have studied yoga, but made up of eight limbs. The physical practice, the pretzel stuff we do on the mat, that's one limb. There are seven others that make up the practice of yoga. One of those is pranayama, or breath work. And there's a whole body of study and, um, and science behind breath work that has been evolving for the last 5,000 years. There's a lot of breath exercise you can do. This is, this is one, it's a basic one. If that didn't resonate for you, but you're interested in breath, there are many others. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards about others or point you in the direction of others. But also, 
what you do in your classroom if you decide to incorporate any of this does not have to be grounded in any sort of yoga practice or meditation practice. What we're trying to do is cultivate mindfulness. And I'll talk a little bit more about mindfulness, but it, it might be it, it might be a whole range of things. So what we teach and I'm sure you all know this from teaching, whatever it is that you teach in your classroom, what we teach needs to be something that we know, that excites us, that we're passionate about. And so if this is not something that you know or you're excited about or interested in knowing about, but you're an artist or a musician or an athlete, maybe you're sharing something from that piece of you. You're sharing something that, that puts you in the zone, something that makes you focused and at peace, and it doesn't have to be from this, this type of practice, but know that there are a really wide range of things that can help your students to get in that focused, mindful zone. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, we'll talk about mindfulness in a minute, a little bit, we'll unpack that in a minute. I like, who, as you start to introduce whatever it is that you're going to introduce, to invite students to give feedback. So you might say, we're going to do something a little different. I want to know how it's working for you. You can tell me in class, you can tell me after class, you can send me an email. I have, since I started this, had so many students come to my office hours or stop me in the hall and say, I love this. Please can we do more of this? Students I would never have accepted. Some of my Jockeyist athletes and some of my just people that I thought this, this is not something that they're going to love and this was my own stereotype and those students were the ones saying please give me a website where I can find more of and do this. So, but, but it's important to open that door for feedback because I've also had very few but a couple students who say I don't know why we're doing this and then we can have a conversation about this is why, this is why I think it's important, this is 